All right. Fun stuff. Hello, hello. I appreciated the intro. I had one put together, but don't need. To. We can dive right into the wild ride of of fame, fortune, and the roller coaster of managing a hit music career. But before we do, let's thank John again for inspiring us all with his music uh, and for being here today. Well. I was going to say before we started, uh, I'm not sure exactly why you invited me. I don't know anything about any of those subjects, but <laughs> thanks for anyway. It sounds like it's going to be fun. Well, let's make it easy then. Let's start off with a couple rapid fire questions. Okay. Uh, left handed or right handed? Left handed. Studio recording or live music? Oh, two different animals. I'll take them both. <laughs> Lyric or melody? Lyric. Colorado or Tennessee? Ooh. Man, you're hurting me, dude. <laughs> I love them both. I'm, I'm going to give you my politically correct answers here as best I can. Okay, there's the answer. For those of you that don't know, it's obviously Philadelphia, but John spends a lot of time in both t Tennessee and, yeah. and Colorado, so I thought I'd try to stump him. Um, Elvis Presley or Michael Jackson? Elvis. Nice. Hall or Oates? <laughs> <laughs> nice guy, Alex. Um, I, we, we used to call ourselves the two-headed monster, so let's leave it at that. Very good, very good. So, John, tell us, what was the moment that you realized that this would be a lifetime career? It wasn't a transition point from being a passion to a, a lifelong career? I, you know, I, th I consider myself one of the lucky ones. I, I seem to be, have been born to be a musician. I started singing really as soon as I could talk. I have a recording of me singing at four years old. I've been on stage ever since. Um, I've never had another job uh, other than music. The closest thing would be teaching guitar lessons at one point in college. Uh, so um, it was just something that I just, I guess I had an, some natural ability and uh, it's something that I've always done and never questioned, really. Yeah, well, at least you had the gut instinct to do the right thing, because it worked out really well. I figured in, until someone started booing, then I'd probably just keep going. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, were there any aha moments when it came to understanding the business side of the industry, and, you know, whether it's music royalties or how to make a living, or, hey, I've got to focus on this business side? Well, you know, um, I, I, I'm guilty, as many, many artists are, of making a lot of business mistakes. Um, I think, you know, um, artists making business mistakes and not understanding the intricacies uh, of, of the music business, especially in the publishing world, uh, is really, it's, it's the rock and roll story. I mean, you know, it goes yeah. back to the blues men going up to Chicago and, you know, being handed a bottle of wine and, you know, sign this here and, you know, you're, you're signing away your royalties for the rest of your life. Um, so it's, a, it's really a, it's a story of the music business. I, um, I'm guilty uh, personally of just not paying enough attention, not being, you know, when you're young and you want to just make it, you really don't care about things like that. You, you care about the art, you care about writing, you care about recording, you care about touring. You yeah. want to do those things. They're the things you, you care about. And if someone is willing to pave the way, and if, yeah. and if paving the way means that you may be entering into some agreement that you either don't understand or didn't take the time to understand, well then, that's how it goes. Yeah, unfortunately, that's still the case after all these years, you know, a lot of people. Although I will say that I think a lot of the younger musicians and younger artists who, of today are much more savvy about the music business in general and about how to navigate a very, very complex uh, business and uh, complex, um, you know, here again, especially in the world of publishing. Well, yeah, as, as, as the industry has evolved, especially over the last 10 years uh, since Sound Royalties has been around, what we've seen is the evolution of all these different income streams. Mm -hmm. And you have to be smarter because they may be smaller in certain portions, but there's so many more of them. Well, that's good for you. And, and they, they accumulate into something bigger. And, and, and I think all these catalog sales that we hear about have started to educate people in the value of the copyright and the value of the, the long-term value of holding their copyrights, right? Talk to us about the longevity of your catalog. And what I'm getting at is have there been any instances where 
you've seen a resurgence in your music from maybe a sync or something oh, like that? Absolutely. Um, the Hall & Oates catalog has been very, very uh, fruitful lately, um, and it has been for, for quite some time. Uh, a lot of it started with, um, I think one of the things that really kicked it into high gear was the um, 99 Days of Summer film. I don't know how many of you have seen that. Um, but there was a usage of uh, You Make My Dreams Come True in that, that film that I think was, for me personally, just subjectively, I, I, it was one of my favorite um, blending of film and music. Uh, and I'll tell you, can I tell you a quick yeah. anecdote about yeah. that? Um, I, had, you know, I knew, of course, that, that we had granted a license and a, uh, to, uh, to, for that song to be used in the film, but I didn't know much about the film. And I was in LA uh, with my family and uh, we were at the Grove one afternoon and the film was playing in the afternoon. So we said, hey, let's pop in and check out this movie. So we went in and it was just my wife, my son and I, and sitting not too far away were a group of teenage girls. And that was, we were the only people in the theater because yeah. it was in the middle of the afternoon. And so watching the film, it was really nice. And um, you know, and then this moment came in the park where they start doing this choreographed dance to, to our song. And there's animation, there's little birds flitting around. And it just seemed like the, you know, it was a, almost really a, a perfect filmic symbol of, uh, of falling in love for the first time. And the girls started clapping when oh. the song was over. And, most people don't clap in a movie theater, at least I don't, I don't know about you, but, uh, and I thought to myself, wow, I mean, that really got to them. It really meant something to those girls, that this film, that that moment in the film and that song really came together in, in something that was, that, that elicited an emotional, um, an emotion from them. So I thought that was really cool. And that, that kind of triggered, you know, my mind into thinking, you know, there's, there's a lot, lot, lot of possibilities going on out there. And of course, that song, You Make My Dreams Come True, to this day is ubiquitous. It's everywhere. Um, you know, what we do, Daryl and I will probably agree to two to three requests a week. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty good. But that song, I mean, to me and... Not only for that song, for the entire, lots of songs. Yeah, in of course, but yeah. back to that song, for me, I always felt that it, I've known it forever since it was released. I don't even know what year it was released, if you can recall. Well, and then this was, what, 2008 or nine? But that's the crazy part. That song was never a hit. Uh, compared to our other hits, that song, I think it went into the top ten. I mean, you can, if you guys are, <laughs> may, may know, it may, it may have gone in the top five, I don't know. But it really wasn't a big hit, especially compared to the hits we were having at the, during that time. Um, and in fact, it was never even released in Europe. It was never released in England uh, as a single. So that song, in, over time, took on a life of its own and became a really, really popular, uh, obviously, probably one of our most popular sinks. And, um, you know, so it was kind of, kind of uh, amazing to see it have a, a completely new renaissance and a new rebirth. Yeah, no, it's, it's incredible to see the, the power of sync or the yeah. power of resurgence of a catalog. And I mean, that was probably 30 years later yeah, that it just, it just popped out. Which goes to show you, folks, Write them songs. <laughs> it's all about the songs. Absolutely, absolutely. So everyone likes to ask about, uh, about decisions that people, people may have regretted, but I, I'd rather turn instead of, what decisions did you make along the way that you're like, thank God I made that decision. I'm really glad I made that choice. Uh, <laughs> um, when I, I started playing guitar at five, and my mom took me to a, um, the little mom and pop music store in this little town in Pennsylvania where I grew up. And um, I remember walking in and the, the, the woman who was teaching guitar lessons, um, she took a look at me and my mom said, well, he's left-handed. And the woman said, ah, that won't matter. <laughs> so to this day, I play right-handed like a normal guitar player. Um, I don't know whether that was a big mistake or not, but it's too late now. Um, <laughs> to worry about it. Um, that was a good decision because I don't have to worry about buying left-handed guitars, which are not easy to find. Um, so I'm just joking though. Uh, there's been a lot of things. I mean, just, uh, I think about, I think about the, the, there's certain moments in my life that, that happened that really um, 
dictated where I went and how I did it. My parents, I was born in New York City. My parents, uh, my father's company that he was working for was, tr uh, was uh, moved to Pennsylvania. And so at a very early age, we moved from Manhattan to Pennsylvania where I grew up. So had I not moved to Pennsylvania with who knows who I would have met. Yeah. And then I was wondering where I was going to go to college. I decided to go to Temple University in Philadelphia. Just happened to be the same school where Daryl Hall was going. There was all these moments that just came together. There, were, there was a cosmic plan there somewhere or another. Uh, and um, I just kind of went with it. And see, these, but all those decisions, I decided to stay in Philadelphia because I wanted to be closer to the professional music business. And I didn't want to be in a small college somewhere or uh, in another state. So um, these were conscious decisions that, you know, kind of, and then leaving Philadelphia in the early 70s, moving to New York City, and really basically starting my professional music career in New York City was also a very important conscious decision. There's been a bunch of them. So have you ever tried left-handed guitar? Or? No, I don't even <laughs> no. Too far gone for that. You've shared with me in the past, um, and we've discussed, and I really think this, this audience would benefit and would love to hear your thoughts on the evolution of, of pop music. I, I know we've talked about it in the past, and I, it just blows my mind every time you, you, you talk about it, and it just puts it all in perspective for me. Could you share a little bit about about that? Well, I, first of all, I'm a history buff. Um, and uh, I did an album in 17 called, it ended up being called Arkansas. And originally it was supposed to be a, a tribute to one of my childhood idols, Mississippi John Hurt. And I wanted to do an album that uh, was um, basically to play some of his songs. Um, but as we got into it, I realized that the possibility of, of making something that was a little more expansive and something that uh, could be a little bit more wider uh, in scope was to take a look at some of the music that he made in his early recording career in, between, in the late 1920s when he was on OK Records. And what I started doing was I started looking at uh, jukebox playlists, what was being played in the jukeboxes of, of the rural South. And I was shocked to find that there was cowboy music, Gene Autry. There was ragtime. There was um, all sorts of unusual songs. And then I started thinking, well, I wonder what, if Mississippi John Hurt was growing up in this area, and these were the songs that he was listening to, that had to influence who he became as a musician. So I dug back further, and I had this revelation about the confluence of American popular music, the invention of radio, and the invention of the phonograph machine. Because those three things are, they're, they're, they're wedded together. Because there is no American popular music without a delivery system. And that delivery system was radio and the invention of the phonograph. So when you think about pop music, those three things, especially in the earliest or early days, and really it still carries over today, even though phonograph machines are a thing of the past and now we have streaming, et cetera, but it's still a delivery system that has to be in place for this music to be accepted on a, on a larger scale. And I started looking at that and I said to myself, wow, I'm a pop musician, I've been making pop music, that's where I, I kind of, uh, I'm, that's what I'm known for, but I had no idea where it started. Yeah. And I, I thought to myself, well, I, maybe perhaps, and I, I don't want to assume, but perhaps a younger generation, um, a younger generation might assume that pop music started with rock and roll. Well, far be it from the truth, there were millions selling records in 1918, 1919, 1920. So I wanted to start exploring those, those songs. And just think about it conceptually. Think about how important that was and what, what, what an, an amazingly important and groundbreaking moment it was when for the first time people could hear music in their homes. They could actually hear music that wasn't being played in real time by a musician. It's hard for us to almost imagine that concept, but if prior to the radio and, and the phonograph machine, if you wanted to hear music, you had to go and listen to someone play or sing. That was the only way, and once they were finished doing that, it was over. There was no way to, 
that it could be repeated, that it could be savored, that it could be, you know, understood and embraced emotionally, physically, mentally. So this is a groundbreaking moment that I don't think a lot of people consider. And it's really the birth of, of why American popular music set the standard for the rest of the world. And as it spread around the world, and it was able to be spread around the world through these delivery systems. And if you go back to 1918, and if you look at how music has evolved with that, if you look at the 20s, the music was different than in the 30s and the 40s. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think impacted that? Well, you know, popular music has always reflected the, the culture, the times, the, the zeitgeist of the moment, you know, um, and it's still to this day. Um, you know, it's, it's really, um, it's a reflection of, of the mentality of the people who are making it and the people who are listening to it. Um, you know, I, people always say, well, you know, what's a hit? What makes a hit? I think a, I think a hit is, is when someone creates something that somehow resonates with the large, a large group of the population in some way. I don't know how, I mean, it's magic. It really is, you know, yeah. I, I don't want to sound too hippy-dippy about it, but writing songs is magic. I mean, you're pulling something from nothing. You're uh -huh. taking something, you know, an emotion, an experience, um, and you're, you're creating something that perhaps other people can't articulate, but they, when they hear it, it resonates within them. And uh, that's really an amazing thing. Yeah, I, th I think I saw at one point uh, on the charts in the 20s where a lot of party songs and celebration songs, and in the 30s it was uh, Will I Ever Work Again? Sure, because of the depression and things yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah can, I sp can you spare yeah. a dime, that kind of stuff? Sure, listen to the music of the 20s. You know, you had the roaring 20s. It was a very, uh, you know, culturally, it was a very exciting and, and vibrant time because World War I had ended, which was one of the most horrible wars in the history of, of Western civilization. And all of a sudden, people were just like free again. And women started wearing short skirts, they cut their hair, all this amazing cultural stuff was happening. And of course, you have the Charleston and they have these crazy dances and flappers and all that people riding around and kids riding around in cars. Um, so that, yeah, you're right, you're 100% right. That 20s were a, uh, a celebration, a celebratory time. And the 30s, of course, when the depression hit, it was like, brother, can you spare a dime? You know, one meatball and all these songs <laughs> that reflect of, of that, that moment. Wow, yeah. Oh, and by the way, just, just another thing. I'm, I'm, I know I'm, I'm going to go off, off here a little bit. Um, there were no teenagers. There were no teenagers prior to 1950. Teenagers did not exist. You were either a kid or you became an adult. And there was no in-between. And most of the times, the kids were adults before they were adults. Um, so you had this, you had this, in the 1950s, you have this incredible thing that happens where you have an actual culture that evolved, teenage culture with fashion and style and their yeah. own music and their own way of thinking. So, and this is, this is really how rock and roll evolved. And, and that's, what, that's what happened with, with uh, rock and roll in terms of its, its ability to, to just latch on to, to a certain group Pop, uh, a popular group, and then from there on, you know, you, you, you know the rest. Yeah. Uh, looking at the evolution of the music business from phonograph and radio, one step back, for hundreds of years, there were musicians that would get paid to perform. And about 140 years ago, the first PRO was born. Two, two composers were sitting in a cafe in France, and they ordered their coffee, and decided they had a nice chat and they decided to order another one, but the price of the coffee had doubled. And, and so they asked their uh, waiter why. And the waiter said, well, we now have musicians playing. And the composer said, they're actually playing one of our songs. And they filed a lawsuit. This was in the late 1800s. And they won the lawsuit. And, and Sassem was actually the first PRO. And that was the birth of, of that evolution of the music business. And then, you know, we talk about radio, we talk about records, and the evolution of music into digital and streaming. It just, it just keeps going and going yeah. and getting wider and wider. Before I get into this next question, I, I know we wanted to make this an opportunity for people to ask questions in kind of Q&A session, so I wanted to remind the audience, 
if you go into the South by Southwest Go app, you can actually ask a question, and Sarah and Adrian are out there, and we'll kind of send them up to us as, as we go along, and we're happy to uh, see if we can answer some of those. Let's, let's, since we've, we talked about the Roaring Twenties and the 1800s since the SIM, <laughs> let's, let's bounce. Everybody's out there like this. <laughs> so let's. What's, what's, what's with this Oats guy in the, in the 1920s? What the hell is he talking about? So you know what? Why don't, we, why don't we throw out a buzzword that'll wake him up? AI. AI, woo. Now you're talking. <laughs> um, so let's, yeah, what, thoughts on the impact of AI? Once the genie's out of the bottle, that's it, folks. Um, it's going to be a very interesting period of time. Uh, I know there's legislation. I know in Tennessee there's the Elvis legislation they're trying to push through to try to control uh, rights and, and uh, make sure that, um, that uh, you know, creators can, can control somehow what's, what's happening. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm interested in it, and I hate, to be, <laughs> I hate to be morbid, but I'm old enough to not have to worry about it because I'm not going to be around when it takes over, so. Um, but interestingly enough, I released some singles last year or the year before, and um, there was one particular song that I released, and I had no concept of what the video should look like. Um, and I wanted to make a video for it. And uh, just on, on a lark, I, I told my uh, team, I said, see if we can find someone to make an AI video on this song, because I have no idea what it should look like. And uh, we found this guy who did it, and it, it it was interesting. It was weird and strange, and I don't know, you know, I don't know if it actually reflected who I am or what I was actually thinking about when I wrote the song. But um, it's hard to say. I don't. I don't. I, I, one thing I do feel, and even though there'll be holographic presentations and you see things like the sphere and you see the direction that that live entertainment is going in, um, I think there's. A, it's going to be very difficult to replicate the the relationship between an audience and a live performer. I think there's a, there's a certain magic there that is very, very important to preserve. And I, I don't think AI, nor holographs, nor spheres, nor you know, um, incredible uh, high-tech production is ever going to be able to, it can enhance it, but I think there's a, there's a real a serious, you know, visceral connection between a performance, someone who's playing live, and an audience to receive it. Uh, that's, that's really, that's just my take. I could be wrong, but time will tell, I guess. Well, you, you touched on a couple subjects there, and, and one was AI in terms of artists, and I know, I think it was Warner Universal signed an AI artist. That's, I mean, and, and I talked to another label that's releasing an AI artist, and they're creating a massive amount of content because they're like, look, this AI artist, she can, well, they say it's a she, but, she can release 500 uh, pieces of, of social media content a day, <laughs> you know, and it's just an hour. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, just pump it out yeah. and, and, and the music. But it, I, I think there is something about the heart and soul of it. And so that's the other piece that you touched on. I wanted to, to ask about in terms of, you know, I see writers using it, you know, chat GPT for writing yeah. and stuff. Have you ever experienced any of that or seen that? I tried chat GPT. Um, I asked for, you know, I asked, asked it to write a song, a, John Oates song, and I gave it some, you know, s silly subject, uh, you know, direction with, you know, a beach, a girl, a sunny day, whatever, you know. Um, and it, it spit it out in about a, less than a minute. There were four verses. And? Actually pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, so I'll be stealing that soon. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reverse, uh, reverse uh, engineer the, I, a, uh, the AI. But you know, one thing that I actually do that really concerns me is that what about, what about artists who are no longer with us, yeah. but have a body of work? And I'll just use for an example, let's take anyone, let's take David Bowie. Um, there's an amazing body of work with a, an incredible catalog of incredible songs and a unique voice and a unique... Um, unique, you know, presentation, a lot of things. Um, what's to prevent AI from extrapolating from this incredible body of work and creating new David Bowie songs with David Bowie singing? Pretty much nothing can stop that unless there's either legislation or people just don't want it to happen. So I'm, I'm a little concerned about things like that. 
uh, being an artist who obviously is older and I, you know, um, what's going to happen to my musical legacy if there's no one there to control it? Yeah. I, there, there will be legislation, there is legislation popping up now, but it, the legislation works for the borders that acknowledge it mm -hmm. and, and respect it. And so it, it, we'll, we'll see what happens over time with that. It's definitely interesting. I, I see now that if you go into ChatGPT and say, hey, I want you to write a John Oates song, sometimes it'll say, well, you know, yeah. but if you say like John Oates or, you know, oh, in I'm the sure. style of, mm. then, then it works, works a, a little better. Then it writes a song that sounds like Daryl Hall. <laughs> <laughs> But then there's so many uses of it, right? I was uh, with some songwriters in Nashville, and they'd written a really good song, in my opinion, but mm -hmm. we'll have to see what the fans think, right? Okay. But they wanted to send it to an artist, and I said, so you're gonna do a demo now? They used uh, artificial intelligence to do a demo in the artist's voice. Mm. And so, yeah, that so is, someone send you a John Oates song. It's that sort of thing that, that is really scary. Yeah. Yeah. So is. you could say, oh, this sounds like me and it's good, or no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and I, I was amazed at the technologies. It, and it, these writers were tech savvy, believe me, but mm -hmm. you know, they weren't programmers or anything. And to be able to, to do this and, and to work the prompts, it's, it's, it's amazing. We'll have to see where it comes, goes exactly. in years to come. Yeah. Um, congrats on the book. Change the oh, Seasons, thanks. Um, a memoir. What, what inspired you to write it? Um, well, I've always, in, you know, I, I love writing in general. I went to journalism school, um, and I, um, you know, whether it be songs, prose, it doesn't matter to me. Um, and I've always entertained the idea of writing a book, and I had done a series of interviews with a guy named Chris Epting, who grew up in Pennsylvania, not far from where I grew up. And um, every time I do an interview with him, uh, he seemed to get me. and. Um, we would get very deep into these com great conversations. And um, at one point, he, he said, you have so many incredible stories. He goes, you, have you ever thought about writing a book? And I said, well, I, I have. I've thought about it, but I've never. He said, well, I'd like to help you. He's, he's written a number of books. Um, and that was the catalyst that really made me get off my butt and, and do it. Uh, it took about two years, and Chris was an incredible asset to that pro uh, pro process. He, uh, he's a great editor, and he did an incredible amount of research. Um, I gave him journals that I had been keeping over the years, and he would pour through these journals, finding these moments, moments that I had completely forgotten. And in, in, this, in a sense, writing the book became a gift to me personally because it, it allowed me to recall and remember things that had I not done the book project, I may never have remembered for the rest of my life. And so it was a really interesting thing. It was cathartic, and it was, it was a, an exercise in, in kind of almost like a regressive therapy, you know, going back in time. Uh, and uh, it took me about two years to do it. Um, and um, the, the hardest thing that, that, I, that I had to, uh, to deal with was how do I write a book about my personal experience when my personal experience is so intrinsically wrapped up in the Hall and Oates experience with a partner. So it was a very, very interesting uh, challenge to, to somehow do that. I hope I did it. Well, it's available on Amazon, folks. <laughs> you can decide for yourselves. Yeah, I, I thought you did a great job, and, and, and I enjoyed it. And I also enjoyed one of the things that is it started from the very beginning. We were talking about Queen and, and how the film just starts that all of a sudden he walks in and he's... He's a star. He's a star. Right. And it doesn't work like that. Follows the career. <laughs> right. You know, and, and so it really, and I think you even covered at the beginning, I, I really enjoyed the, the first time you heard uh, yourself on the radio. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> oh you're going to team me up for that? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, let's keep in mind it was the 60s. Um, I was parking with my girlfriend. You know what that is? <laughs> <laughs> that means you didn't have a house to go to. <laughs> so you had to do whatever you were gonna do in a car. <laughs> on a dirt, on a little country road in Pennsylvania. And um, we were making out in the car. And the song, my song came on the radio for the first time. And I don't really remember much. All I remember is that I stopped doing whatever we were doing. And I was just like, Oh my I'm a star. God, I'm on the radio. <laughs> I'm a star. Yes. <laughs> 
So. That's what I would be doing. I'd be like, I'm a star. <laughs> well, I wasn't a star, but I was on the radio. It was a step in the right direction. Absolutely. And it was a long way from there. It wasn't an overnight success even from there. No, 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 no. So the book definitely covers it, and I loved it. Is there anything that you hope that people get from it? What? Well, I think, you know, it's, it's very difficult when you're a member of a band or a duo, a duo in particular, to really carve out your own individual personality and be, and be, and be really, you know, understood for who you are as a person. Because even, you know, regardless of, of how tight or how, um, how the world perceives a group or a duo, there's always two people. Yeah. And, you know, in, in the case of Daryl and I, we've always perceived ourselves as two individuals who work together. And we were never, we never felt like we were joined at the hip. In fact, it's, an, it's kind of, you know, it's, if you look at any of our albums, going back to the very first album, on, the, on every album cover it says, Daryl Hall and John Oates. There's not one time that it says Hall and Oates, because we never thought of ourselves as a group. We thought of ourselves as two guys working together for however long it's going to last. And um, it seems like a subtle distinction, but it's an important distinction. Uh, at least, you know, for us, it was a very important distinction because we were, we were, we were trying to, to maintain our autonomy in this thing where people are always trying to put you together. I remember one time I was in, <laughs> I was in a dressing room before a show, and I was sitting in the room by myself, and... Um, one of the staff people from the backstage area came in the room, poked his head in the room, said, looked at me and said, which one of you guys is hauling oats? <laughs> I said, all right, I'll take it. <laughs> so you talk about holding true to yourself in terms of your music. What advice do you give to creatives today that beyond that in terms of following the popular uh, music stream or in a streaming world where you can be just about anything? Well, I think you t if you're talking about musicians or artists or creators who are trying to find themselves and find yeah. their individual identity, I think that it's the age-old um, the, the age rules apply. You know, study the masters, study the people you love, uh, and try to try to break down what it is about them that you find interesting or engaging or what, what touches your soul about their, them or their music. And in doing so, especially if you're willing to put in the time to actually learn their songs, play their music, understand how they think, how they impose melody over chord changes, what type of chord progressions they might be thinking about and using. Those things are keys that unlock the musical personality. And if you're, a, if you're a young creator and you can understand, like, let's say you, you, uh, you're a big fan of Joni Mitchell. Well, you, you go and try to play those songs. You go try to learn those Joni Mitchell songs and try to understand her, her approach to her poetic lyrics. Try to understand the unusual guitar tunings that she was using um, that, that give her a certain unique personality that set her apart from so many other people. Um, that's, to me, that's, that's the way to go. Uh, that's what I did, that's an, every musician, especially older musicians uh, that I know, that's what they've, we've all done. You know, you try to, you know, uh, I wanted to sound like Curtis Mayfield, I wanted to sound like Mississippi John Hurt, I wanted to sound uh, like Chuck Berry, whatever. Um, so I studied them and I, and I learned the songs, and I learned to play like that and I learned to sing in a certain way. So um, to me, that's the stepping stone to, uh, to finding your, your own individual creative identity. No, that's good, thank you. There's a, looking at the music business today and looking at it 50 years ago, the big dichotomy is today there's more, and there's, you have to get further along as a creative to get a publisher or label to pick you up they expect to see more success, right? And that's why as a business, we see more creatives that are signed or unsigned coming to us for funding because they want to fund the projects that aren't funded or they want to take themselves further. But looking at those two, 50 years ago, unless you had a record deal, mm. unless you had that publishing deal, your song wasn't gonna get pitched, unless you had a record deal, it wasn't gonna make it to radio. Today, if you come up with something on TikTok it, that's interesting or you can get a fan base, you get it heard and then you get the attention. Which do you think is, 
better. No, it's neither better nor worse. It's, it's reflective of the times. Um, the old paradigm of the, the major label and their unholy alliance with radio um, would, you heard what I said, right? Um, <laughs> You guys don't give a shit, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, what's radio? Oops, did I say that? No, I didn't say that. Anyway, um, you know, that's, that's, that was what it was. It was, you know, you tried to get a record deal. You signed a contract. Major label funded you. Yeah. They gave you money to get started, make your record. Of course, everything was recoupable, which they never talked about a lot. Um, and then you, you went on from there. You, hopefully you went on tour. And then you needed tour support because you, know, you can't just travel around the country in a, with a band if you don't have any money. So you go to the label and the label gives you money to do that and that's recoupable. And next thing you know, you find yourself in a big hole um, unless you have success. But the good thing about that was many, many times, and not all the time, but many times these labels would invest in an artist because they believe that they might have a career, a long career that they could then partner with and take advantage of. That's gone. Now it's all about, as you said, instant success, uh, followers, TikTok, you know, all that sort of thing. The good thing about, about the digital world and this new environment that we're in is that it gives everyone an opportunity to be heard everyone can be heard. Now, the bad thing is that everyone can be heard. <laughs> so, you know, it's really up to you to, uh, when I say you, I mean the collective you, creative you. Um, it's up to you to figure out how to navigate that, how to build on attention that you might get, and whether you can sustain it. So it's not, it's not a great, you know, it's daunting for a young uh, artists, no doubt about it. I work with young artists all the time, and I know how difficult it is. But then again, if if they're good and they really, really work hard, um, and really, you know, really take the time to try to to generate a following through their music, and they, and they they have some skill and, and a talent, it can be done. It's just um, it's not easy. Never, but it never was easy. Well, just even 25 years ago, there was 30,000 new songs a year competing for radio time. You know, what is it now? 100,000 a day? They talk from 60,000 to 150,000 a day. Yeah. Uh, you've seen numbers all over. Uh, it's crazy, but it is what it is. Yeah, and it's just, it's, the business has changed. And yeah. it's, it's adjusting as a, a creative, a writer, an artist, and yep. getting it in the right hands and getting it to your audience and then connecting with the audience. Um, we're going to open up, Sarah and Adrian, to, to questions if you want to start to throw some up there. But first, what's next for you? Where, where are you? Well, I've, um, I've spent the last uh, 10 years, or actually longer now, um, being a completely independent artist. Um, I have no desire to be part of a, a major label. It doesn't mean anything to me. But I have a, you know, I'm very fortunate because I have this incredible legacy of Hall & Oates music mm -hmm. and that has uh, enabled, it's put me in a position to do that, which, you know, it, really every creative person would like to have creative freedom. Creative freedom is the ultimate, the ultimate goal of any creative person, right? But that's not easy to get. Luckily for me, and I, as I said, I'm blessed and fortunate to have this incredible legacy of, of success that now allows me to do whatever I want. So I like to, you know, I, in a way, I, I'm not, you know, I, I want to be, I want to be an example of that. I, I don't want to squander or waste that unique opportunity because it doesn't, not many people ever get to experience that. And so I want to work really hard and I want to be the best I can be and create as, and continue to create as long as my brain and my body allow me to, um, to show that, you know, there's, to show that, show my gratitude for this unique position that I've found myself in. And um, so I'm an independent artist. I make music how and when I want, with who and, and uh, who I want to make it with. Um, I love being in the studio. I, I've been living in Nashville for over 15 years, and I'm really part of the Americana music community at this point, and uh, it's a wonderful group of, of incredibly talented people who really love what they do and, and they do it with integrity and authenticity. 
Um, that's who I want to be around. I, I don't care about the other crap. Um, and if there's anyone who wants to listen, the music's available. And if they don't, well, so be it, you know. Um, I do a, a, an acoustic tour called An Evening of Songs and Stories. I play small to medium-sized venues. Um, Friday in Houston, right? Friday in Houston at the Heights Theater, folks. <laughs> um, show up with a guitar, and I've got a percussionist and a cello player, and I tell stories and we play songs. So are you releasing more music? or I do. I have, a, I have new music coming out. Um, actually, I'm releasing a single April 3rd. It's called Reunion, and it's not what you might think it's about. <laughs> it is about reuniting with yourself. It's about the idea of re-engaging and re-understanding who you really are. It's that, that, that's the reunion that I'm talking about. And uh, that comes out April 3rd, and then there'll be a series of singles that will follow, and then an album will come out for anyone who has the uh, bandwidth to actually listen to more than one song at a time. That's great, that's great. We were talking about it backstage, but do you have any special memories or stories about recording We Are The World? <laughs> yeah, it was, it was great. Um, I was standing right behind Bob Dylan, and Ray Charles was right here off my left shoulder, and I thought, this is a really good place to be. <laughs> um, and I remember Bob Dylan just didn't seem to want to sing. I mean, if you watch the documentary, you'll kind of see it. I don't know whether he just didn't want to, or he, I don't know, it was kind of funny. I kept wanting to hear, we are the world, but I, I never quite did. But um, anyway, it was just a great, it was an ex incredible moment. And it was a moment that um, will probably never happen again, because in those days, there, were, there was only two real music awards. There was the Grammys, and there was the American Music Awards. And this, uh, the, this session of We Are the World followed the American Music Awards, um, because everyone who was anyone in pop was at that award show. So it was very easy to get everyone to come over to the studio after the award show was over and be part of this, you know, really groundbreaking uh, moment and evening. So it was great. And, and it was great to be in that room where everyone let their hair down. And there were no managers, no handlers, no agents. It was just the guys and the girls. And everyone was talking and friendly and... I don't think that could ever happen again. It was so, I was, I was actually proud to be part of it. Yeah, that's great. What uh, was the writing process like for Out of Touch? <laughs> Out of Touch? Um, interesting time. Uh, in the mid 80s was an interesting time in recording as a recording artist because analog recording had reached its zenith. It was never going to get any better. We were recording on multiple uh, tape machines, you know, 48, 64 tracks uh, in sync. Um, and digital recording and digital equipment was in its infancy. It was just being developed. So because Daryl and I were, were at the top of the pop world at the time, they were giving us all these incredible new instruments, uh, sampling synthesizers, polyphonic synthesizers for the first time, things that, were, that could do uh, we, we could, things we couldn't dream of. And we were getting to use them in the studio. And at the same time, there was equipment being developed for your home where you could actually record at home. Prior to that time, if you wanted to make a record, you pretty much had to go to a recording studio. But now you could record on little tape decks and things yeah. like that. So uh, I was living in Greenwich Village at the time, and it was in the middle of the night. I had, this, I had bought myself a little synthesizer, which I had no clue on how to use. Uh, and I was sitting there. It was like 3 o'clock in the morning. And, well, because I was stoned, I just hit this button, <laughs> on, and it went, dunk, 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 dunk. And I went, oh, that's good. <laughs> and... I went I said, that's a song, here we go. And went into the studio and Daryl and I finished it up and turned out pretty good. You've been public about you're influenced and you play a lot of different genres. I mean, you really embrace music. Did I hear something about Maneater being originally in reggae or? Well, the idea for yeah. it was, like, I had come back from Jamaica, and I was in, um, in the, I was living in a village at the time, in Greenwich Village, New York, and uh, I went to, a, yeah, I went to a, a, a place where we used to hang out late at night, and this gal came in, and she was gorgeous, just unbelievably beautiful, and she sat across from me, and the first thing she told me was the, the filthiest joke I had ever heard in my life, and I thought, God, she's so beautiful, and she swears like a sailor. I said, God, that's exciting. 
and scary all at the same time. <laughs> so as I was walking home, I started thinking, wow, she would chew you up and spit you out. Hmm, <laughs> wait a minute. My songwriter antenna went up. And um, I had just come back from Jamaica, so I had a reggae feel in my head. I wrote the chorus as a reggae song, then Daryl and I got together. He said, man, this is cool, he said, but I think it doesn't sound like us. And I said, okay, what do you got? And he came up with, gong, 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 gong. And I was, well, really glad I listened to him, first of all. <laughs> um, and, uh, but over the years, I always wanted to re-record it. So about a, two years ago, I went to Kingston, Jamaica, and um, a very good friend of mine, native Wayne Jobson, who's a producer, a reggae producer, uh, he assembled the guys who played with Bob Marley, Toots and the Maytals, um, Peter Tosh, and I had this all-star reggae band in, in the studio, and we re-recorded it as a reggae song. So it's out there in the streaming universe, folks, if you want to hear it. What are your thoughts on uh, the modern industry signing content creators over songwriters and artists? I, 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 they're going to make a buck any way they can. I, I have no opinion on it, really. Yeah, yeah. Well, tends, it, you've, it's already spoken in the sense that you see a lot more one-hit flashes, not even wonders. Yeah, you know, I mean, everyone can make a record on their laptop in their bedroom, so go to have at it. Looking back or looking to today, are there any inspirations from artists? Oh, there's so many. You know, what I've, what I've found is that the young artists who are dedicated and have a lot of talent are incredibly talented and miles ahead of where I was and my contemporaries were at the same age. It's not even in the same universe. I mean, you know, I hear someone like Jacob Collier and I'm like, oh my Lord. You know, I mean, this guy's like, he's just on a different level. Yeah. You know, incredible. And, and then, you know, I saw, I was with Billy Strings the other night, you know, and He's just unbelievable. He's, but he's he's got his foot in 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 one foot in in the in the um, in the old traditional acoustic bluegrass world, but he's taking it to a whole new level. And his skill set is is you know unbelievable. So, you know, there's so many great people. I you know, uh, there's really really good good stuff happening. You just got to sift through um, all the other stuff to find it. You mentioned blues. So, can you explain your connection to traditional? blues and the importance of keeping traditional blues alive? Well, as I was growing up in the early 60s, the folk revival hit. And um, I, had a, I had a very good friend whose um, older brother had gone to college in North Carolina. And when he came home at Christmas break, he brought all these traditional albums. He brought Mississippi John Hurt and Doc Watson and um, Pete Seeger and even Joan Baez and, and uh, Dave Van Ronk, people like that. And so I, uh, as a young guitarist, I wanted to learn that music. But of course, it wasn't as easy as, as it is on YouTube today, where you have people demonstrating stuff for you. We, we had to drop the needle, you know, you had to <laughs> you know, play a record, put the needle down, listen for five seconds, pull it off and go, oh, and figure out what. But the hard part was a lot of these old folk and, and traditional artists, their guitars weren't even tuned. So you had no idea what key they were in. And so you couldn't just, you know, nowadays you go on YouTube and you'll find someone who can demonstrate a, a you know, yeah. a, a song exactly the way it was played, you know. Um, but it, it was just, um, it was one of those things where I just wanted to, I, I began to see the, the, um, the continuity and between this, the early uh, rural roots music that was coming out of the Deep South and the early days of rock and roll. And it all made sense to me. And it, it was a continuum. It wasn't, it wasn't, genre. It wasn't, oh, this is the blues, and this is rock and roll, and this is ragtime. It all, it all kind of, I saw the continuum of, of this great stream of American popular music, and uh, I, I've always thought of music that way. Here's a fun one from the audience. What club in Philly gave you a gig when no one else would? <laughs> well, since we're in Austin, um, ah, it's, it, yeah. I'll, I'll make a little Austin-centric comment on that. Uh, when Daryl and I were first starting out, we used to just show up in art galleries and stuff with a, he'd play, we'd bring, we'd like literally carry an, a Wurlitzer electric, electric piano and I'd bring an acoustic guitar and it was just the two of us. We played a place called the World Control Studios. It was probably 1970. Um, it, it held about 25 people. And the other group on the bill was Asleep at the Wheel with Ray Benson. 
who, was, who grew up not far from where I grew up as well. Um, and um, so Ray Benson and I, and me and Daryl, we started at the exact same time in this little coffee house in Germantown, Pennsylvania. Um, so uh, I guess um, there was a lot of things like that. So Chloe asked, as a singer-songwriter, I'm struggling to find my unique sound. What advice do you have to find it? Well, I kind of talked about that. Uh, yeah. I talked about studying the people you love and, and trying to understand what makes them tick musically and, and learn from them, try to, you know, the best thing you can do is, is play their songs and figure out how they do what they do. Um, and in, in, in doing so, perhaps an original an original direction might evolve if you have the creativity. I, I can't really say much more than that. And then James asks, uh, did you ever face any doubts that your music would resonate with the audience? And if so, how did you man manage that? Um, there's been times when it hasn't worked, um, but I, I've always been very self-reliant and I've always been driven. So. Um, just try to chalk it up as a, as a creative mistake and maybe the best advice would be how can you learn from those mistakes? So is that the advice you'd give John Oates when he was 20 years old, if you could go back and talk to him now? No, the advice I'd give John Oates back then would be get a better lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> Did you, for you and Daryl, for, for uh, Daryl Hall and John Oates, releases. Did you collaborate together or was one song uh, typically one person or we the other? Actually, we actually wrote a lot independently. Um, you know, I think, I think there's a common misconception about uh, um, writing teams. Uh, you take, uh, if you want to take like the classic writing team, the, you know, the, the, if you go back to the Brill Building or even back to the, here again, to the 20s and everything. You know, you had a lot of times the, the old classic writing team was, a, was an instrumentalist, and a lyricist, you know, and I, the best example for me, one of my favorite uh, uh, is uh, Lieber and Stoller, the great Lieber and Stoller. I, I, I worked with uh, Jerry Lieber's son, Jed, um, and I got to meet Jerry Lieber, who I consider to be one of rock and roll's greatest lyricists of all time. Um, and, um, but that, you know, and a lot of people think it's, it's, it was done together. It's very seldom done together. Look at Jagger and Richards, look at Lennon and McCartney. Um, a lot of times they wrote separately, but then they came together and it, it, it was a kind of a flexible relationship and that's how it was with me and Daryl. Um, sometimes, you know, Daryl would have basically a whole song and I, you know, he'd play it for me and I'd say, well, you know, it's like one of those, you can't see the forest for the trees. Sometimes as a writer, you're so deep inside your own thoughts and your own, you know, uh, direction that someone might say, well, you know what? That thing that you think is the hook might be better as a bridge. Why don't yeah. you use this? And, and that happens a lot. So sometimes you, know, you function as an editor for the other person. Sometimes, sometimes it's a true collaboration. Sometimes it's, um, you know, one might write the mu music, you write the lyrics together, or you write the music together, and one writes the lyrics. There's no, there's no rules, really. Has, has your musicianship or has your artistry or your writing changed over the past 50 years? Oh, yeah. I'm way better now. <laughs> and do you approach it differently or? Well, I, I you know, I mean, I, without going into too much detail, um, playing, being on tour with Hall & Oates for 30, 40 years, however long it was, 50 years, it was crazy. Um, I just felt like it was something I could do. Um, I could do in my sleep. Uh, it wasn't very challenging for me to play the big hits because I've been playing them for so long. Um, moving to Nashville was, one of the, was a real wake-up call for me. When I started to play in the studio with some of the great instrumentalists, the, the Sam Bush, Jerry Douglas, Bella Fleck, you know, these incredible, Tom Bukovac, Guthrie Trapp, these incredible instrumentalists, and I realized that my name and reputation might get me into the door, but if I really wanted to stay at the party, I had to up my game. And it was a real wake-up call, and I, I began to woodshed and practice. So in the early 2000s, I started to, to take my guitar playing a lot more seriously because I could, there was things I could do in my sleep, but I couldn't do anything more than that. And I said, well, wait a minute. That's, that's not going to cut it here in Nashville. And um, you know, say what you want about Nashville, but I'll tell you, folks, it's the greatest collection of musicians on the planet. There's 
No place on earth where more talent is focused in one little place. Um, and if you're not good in there, you're, <laughs> you might as well go home because it's, it's serious, uh, serious level, high level. And so I, you know, when I realized where the, um, where the, where the, the benchmark was, I started practicing. And yeah. I, to this day, I practice probably more than I ever have in my life. So Isabel asks, uh, what is your involvement like in Palm Springs when the morning comes is one of my favorite songs of all time? <laughs> um, no involvement at all. Uh, here again, we get these requests frequently. Um, that was a request. Uh, we get it from our publisher and our label um, who reaches out to us and say, hey guys, we've got this cool little uh, video um, streaming show called Palm Strings. They want to use When the Morning Comes. What do you think? And a lot of times we'll say, well, what's it, what's it about? They might send us an, uh, a, a, you know, a, snip, a snippet of the script so we can tell if it's not offensive or, you know, crap. And you know, and if we like it, we say yes. And if we don't like it, we say no. So, simple as that. You talked a little bit about pockets of the music industry, you know, 50 years ago. How has the Philadelphia music scene, do you think, changed from 50 years ago into today? Oh, I have no idea. I haven't lived in Philadelphia for 50 years. Yeah. So um, all I know is that when I was there, it was Gamble and Huff and um, two of the greatest greatest songwriter, producers, entrepreneurs ever. Um, I am, I, you know, Daryl and I actually had an opportunity to work with Gamble and Huff um, as we were starting out, but we wanted to kind of carve our own path, and instead of staying in Philadelphia and working with them, we went to uh, New York and, you know, kind of did our own thing. But um, I have the highest respect for the, those records that they've made, you know, with the Intruders and the OJs and the Stylistics and Tommy Bell in particular, one of the great unsung heroes of uh, R&B, um, unbelievable songwriter, and Linda Creed who wrote a lot of lyrics with him. They're just great, amazing, amazing people. And uh, what's going on in Philadelphia right now? I, I think it's the Eagles, but that's <laughs> pretty much all I know. So last question, how do you keep your passion for music? while it's still your career and, and your job? Uh, it's the only thing I've ever done my whole life. I, I don't know what else to say. I, I don't want it to end, you know? I, 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 so I just, I'm just gonna enjoy it. I work harder. I, I, I've crafted my career now to a sustainable level where I know physically how many shows I can do. I know what my voice can handle, what it can't, what my brain can handle. Uh, I like being home. Um, and I like doing it in a really straightforward, simple way. And that's why I enjoy this acoustic show that I'm doing. Thanks, John. Yeah, uh, thank you. And everybody, let's thank John for coming today. <laughs> All right.